Hello and good morning, good afternoon and good night uh, to the audience uh, for the both people who are actually uh, following us in live or maybe people who will actually check this video afterwards. This is Jordi Arrufi. I'm uh, currently in charge of uh, uh, Barcelona Digital Talent Program. This is a program that is aimed to boost digital skills, especially in the Barcelona ecosystem and is um, led by Mobile World Capital, the organization I belong to, organization that actually works in order to boost digitization, especially in the Barcelona ecosystem. Um, I will be uh, playing the role of the moderator of this session about the future of jobs and also about the new skills um, that will be needed in the market due to this uh, uh, explosion of digitization. So nowadays, um, technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, big data, IoT, uh, blockchain, and so on and so on are, are, let's say, a commonplace. And this is also transforming how companies drive value into the market, the, the business models, and also the skills that actually they are already requiring, by especially the, the skills that will require them in the future. Uh, for instance, according to this uh, famous report about uh, the future of jobs by World Economic Forum, by 2025, um, 85 million jobs in the world will be destroyed due to digitization. There are a high risk of automation. Usually are works, uh, low cognitive works, but not only, also uh, blue, uh, blue and in white collar jobs that may be uh, for instance, uh, substituted by artificial intelligence, by robots, etc. But also by 2025, World Economic Forum expects to, to create in the world to be created over 97 million jobs, 97 million jobs. And if you check those top 10 jobs about those 97 million jobs, the most trendy jobs by 2025, uh, nine out of those 10 jobs are likely are very, very related with digitization. Um, so um, to discuss to discuss with this topic and especially to cover um, how this new paradigm of, of skills should be let's say approached by schools and how schools should train also those new skills I have um, coming along here today with two uh, luxury panelists um, uh, speakers one is Fiona is a director at the Lego Foundation, where she leads the organization's work on technology, play and skills development in education systems. She has over 15 years of experience working at the intersection of technology and innovation to support education and international development outcomes. She was previously senior director at the GSMA, Mobile for development and she started her career as a teacher. And also we have with us Sonia Prior Jones. She's a facilitator and strategist with over 20 years of successful K-20 education administrative experience. Sonia believes in the boundless potential of new ideas and their stewardship. She has expertise in project management, program design, resource raising and strategic alliances. Sonia currently serves as the chief implementation officer as the, at the FAB Foundation and is the founder of FAB House, a house that actually um, belongs to the international network of FAB Labs. So how this session will work like? Um, we will have now the first block in which each of the speakers, including me, will introduce some insights, um, will share some ideas about the topic, about the future of jobs, about the future of skills, and about schools dealing with this new scenario. Including me, by, by the way, I will have, uh, let's say, shorter time than them, but uh, I will also share some ideas. Then it will be Fiona following me, and then it will be Sonia also sharing her insights. After that, we will launch the debate. So we will have 
um, up to uh, uh, until half past five, uh, the, the, the latest, um, I'm, I'm speaking about um, European Central European time, okay, to have a, a discussion, a debate with our panelists. I will launch them questions, but also we encourage the audience, especially to participate and be part of the debate. Has to be very informal, but also very insightful. So, if it's okay for you, I will share my screen and I start with my brief presentation about these 21st century skills. So let me share my screen. One second. Mm -hmm. And someone just has to tell me if you can, uh, well, uh, let me check because I don't see the screen. So, sorry, one second. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Please tell me if you can see my screen. I'm sharing right now. Can you see my screen? No. Yes. Yes, good. Okay, with the slide 21st century skills for the future, right? Yeah, so, yes? No. That slide. There's no slide? Okay. Wait a second, sorry. This is, you know, live broadcasting. Now, now, wait a second. Now you should be seeing my screen. Okay. Okay. So the first idea I wanted to share is about this mushrooming of uh, digitization of uh, technologies like IoT, artificial intelligence, big data, you know, that they're uh, uh, almost on, on the news uh, in a daily basis. And we believe that actually this is happening due to three main trends. The first is the actually exponential growth and the nature of exponential growth of um, enabling technologies like computing power, like uh, data storage, like connectivity networks. For instance, in Barcelona, we are one of the uh, cities leading the 5G developments and 5G use cases uh, and, uh, and communication technology that is way more powerful, offering a brand with uh, way more powerful than the previous generations. So those enabling technologies actually has been um, developing and performing in an exponential way. And nowadays we are in a certain typing point where they are uh, enabling new technologies that are able to do things that were impossible before. And those technologies that are being enabled by those enabling technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data, IoT, um, cloud computing, and so on and so on, are able to do things, um, unbelievable things that were not possible to just uh, dream uh, in the past. Like for instance, thinking on uh, designing and developing and implementing uh, self-driving cars, right? Uh, and this is the, the first trend, the, the exponential nature of technology. The second trend is that technology is not only powerful, is also uh, cheaper than ever, okay? so. Actually, the cost of technology, especially digital technology that is uh, creating zero marginal cost, so this is very scalable and is easy to, to be deployed and, and to supply services and solutions to, to new uh, end users, is becoming cheaper and cheaper. And when a technology is cheaper, it means that mm, it's more democratic. So more people, so more citizens, but also more organizations and companies can implement them in their core business. So not only big corporates, but also uh, startups and also SMEs. And third, so last but not least, um, we're seeing how cloud, cloud computing uh, is commoditizing certain technologies. So we're seeing how the leading companies in, in cloud services are offering um, high-end technologies like um, artificial intelligence or virtual reality almost as a service and in a very commoditized way. So it is easier than ever to implement this technology, it's cheaper than ever, and it's more powerful than ever. And that's why we are in this uh, world where technology is actually transforming the way companies and the way society actually is, is evolving. Um, this data that I'm showing now in, in the screen is about this report about of World Economic Forum asking companies to what extent they will be implementing those 
so-called disruptive technologies by 2025. And you can see here that uh, technologies like cloud computing or big data fit to be implemented at most of the company by over 80% of the companies by 2025. So this is not only a thing of the late future, this is uh, about the near future. So many companies are expecting to, imp to, to implement those technologies in their organizations. But of course, if they do that, and actually they are already doing it, um, they will enable a new way to, to, to drive value into the market. So I'm sorry because I'm showing a lot of pictures in this slide, but this is just an example of how certain industries are being transformed due to the implementation of those technologies. So what kind of changes those technologies are enabling? For instance, in a classic and historical industry like um, the, the automobile industry, the car uh, manufacturing industry, we are envisioning a future that is electric. So it means also that the engine of the electric car is, is way more sil simple. So it means that actually uh, the assembly line uh, doesn't need so many employees. We also envision a, a future of, um, of uh, car manufacturing that is uh, connected so IoT cars connected to the infrastructure, connected to other vehicles and so on, and offering supplying services to the drivers, but also to the infrastructure managers and so on and so on. We envision a shared vehicle uh, future, so a mobility as a service uh, approach, and also in maybe not that far future autonomous car around our cities. Uh, regarding healthcare, for instance, um, we see uh, way more uh, preventive approaches. So companies using sensors and other kind of uh, data sourcing tools in order to uh, prevent, uh, for instance, health diseases, in order to anticipate the strokes and so on and so on. Using data also to do a way more accurate diagnosis, using, using supercomputers to, to do way more accurate diagnosis, also to tailor made the treatment for each patient and also to make uh, uh, the doctor's uh, services way more uh, accessible to the patients. Regarding, for instance, manufacturing, we are envisioning a, 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 manuf a manufacturing facility that is hyper-connected, so this is able to predict demand, is able to uh, provide predictive maintenance, and so on and so on. We see people already collaborating with robots, so the cobots are already something that is uh, almost in place in many factories. Also, manufacturing is servitizing the products, so they are adding uh, layers of, of digitization of sensors in order to transform the product into a service. We see also how also manufacturing is uh, customizing their products thanks to additive manufacturing tools. And just to put another example, for instance, the future of law, also future of law is um, envisioned to be disrupted due to those technologies. For instance, um, AI driven automation, so how um, AI engines are able to even write uh, claims and papers in, in, in the law, in, let's say jobs, or even predictive analytics. So based on historical information, there are certain tools already, like legal tech startups that are able to predict to what extent a trial uh, will you know, finish in, in favor of uh, one side or the other or even this intermediation. So um, robots and automatic tools online that are able to provide a legal service uh, based on artificial intelligence to the end user. So those are just examples of how traditional industries, incumbent industries are being transformed or expected to be transformed due to the implementation of this massive actually implementation of technology. And of course, we can see certain patterns here in, in the site of the skills. Of course, if we want to implement all those transformations, and I'm speaking about a sample of industries, we will need a lot of web developers, a lot of app developers, a lot of people working in cybersecurity, a lot of people working in IoT, in artificial intelligence, in blockchain, and so on and so on. But also those new business models are being developed in a way more uncertain and way more complex um, scenario. 
So those are new services that has to be tested, that has to be scaled and deployed. So they, there's way more unpredictability when dealing with those um, new businesses. So it means also that we need new skills also for, for people who is in charge of these, in these new services, right? So people who is able to communicate better, people who is able to deal and copy with uncertainty and so on and so on. The, the so-called soft skills in which actually humans, we usually perform better than machines, um, thankfully. Um, this, and just in order to, don't repeat again the famous uh, um, quadrant of skills of World Economic Forum, I just copied one uh, that it was lately and recently uh, published by uh, McKinsey and Company about the future of the skills and the skills that will be needed uh, due to this new um, digitization mushrooming. And for instance, part of those skills are hard skills based on digitization, but others are way more soft. Uh, for instance, uh, critical thinking, mental flexibility, communication, teamwork, effectiveness, and so on and so on. This is uh, one of the topics that we'll like to discuss with our panelists, the, the kind of uh, skills that we'll need and especially how schools adapt to them. And to finalize just the final idea about the need to be always learning, right? The, the famous long life learning. Unlike the previous uh, the revolutions or industrial revolutions, where we had a single technology that actually changed everything. For instance, in the second industrial revolution, it was electrification that actually changed the way uh, the value chains were being developed and, and enabled mass production, actually was a technology, it was a single technology that changed everything, but took many years in order to be deployed. It took almost 60 years. So uh, let's say employees had time in order to adapt to this new technology. And it was only one technology that actually changed things. So on average, in a, in a lifetime, people had to adapt to a single technology, right? So you had to adapt more or less on average one time. And unfortunately, by the beginning of 20th century, people had shorter life. And now we're in a completely new scenario. So we, are, we have way more technologies that are, you know, uh, nurturing each other, amplifying each other, and changing also uh, the markets, the way they drive value, and of course, the skills and the jobs. And this is happening all the time and, 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 and in a very accelerated way. And we also have longer lives, fortunately, and also a longer uh, life as an employee or as a professional. So it means that we will have to adapt way more times than in the past. So it is not only about the schools. Uh, we believe that we'll have to be learning all the way, right, in our, in our career. And that's uh, a bit about my, uh, the ideas I wanted to share today. Um, so now I will uh, welcome to the floor, to this virtual floor, to Fiona, okay, to share her insights, and then will be time of Sonia, and then we will start with the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jordi, for that really stimulating introduction, and thank you for taking me to the virtual floor uh, of today's <laughs> conference. Uh, it is technology in action. So it's great to see. I'm just going to try and load a short deck to share that with you today. So as she already said, my name is Fiona Swift. I am a director at the Lego Foundation and I lead our work in technology and play and skills development. So I'll be talking a little bit about our work at the Lego Foundation and how we see how children can develop holistic skills and become lifelong learners in this critical digital age. So just first, a little bit about the LEGO Foundation. So we're the nonprofit entity of the LEGO Group, and uh, we're built on the expertise of the LEGO Group. So we've had nearly 90 years experience developing creative play experiences that develop children's skills. And as Jordi just said, um, it's so important that children, we think of children and adults, to be able to uh, be lifelong learners. And that's really the overall mission for the LEGO Foundation. So we're dedicated uh, to building a future where children can become creative, engaged, lifelong learners. And we see learning through play as being uh, the how children can become creative and engaged lifelong learners. At the foundation, we conduct research with a range of global 
academic partners, run programs with a range of countries and advocate and communicate how children need to develop uh, a breadth of skills. I just want to check that everybody can hear me and see my deck before I go on any further. Sure, we can. Yes, thank you. OK, perfect. Thank you. Great. So just building on to the introduction there, um, we are extremely interested in understanding these changes that are happening, huge changes in technology and rapid changes in new innovations. And um, thinking about what are the skills that children and adults will need uh, in the 21st century. And we know that, that the adoption of technology uh, means that skills are changing. And if we don't take action, then skills gaps will remain high. This map here is a piece of work uh, that we did in collaboration with the Brookings Institute, a global think tank. And that was really promising. It, it shows that governments around the world are recognizing a broader range of skills are needed beyond numeracy and literacy, such as creativity, problem solving, and collaboration. Uh, what we also find out though, that there are gaps between the recognition of these skills and how some education systems are designed and empowered to support students and teachers to uh, foster these skills. And so, and we also find that other education uh, and skills policies often fail to acknowledge that developing a breadth of skills in childhood sets young people up to be uh, lifelong learners. So I think we would definitely say that there's definitely a shift and a much more recognition around the need for 21st century skills, but there's still work to be done to really ensure that all children and all education uh, systems around the world that there's equity in that children, learners, teachers can benefit from uh, learning holistic skills. So at the LEGO Foundation, uh, we are particularly interested in understanding uh, how you develop uh, holistic skills. And there is a growing body of evidence that shows that learning through play, hands-on learning, project-based learning is instrumental in children's development. Uh, from the early years, when it really supports neurological uh, developments, to uh, early learning and later learning, so that children can foster a range of holistic skills. And through a lot of research, uh, there's five kind of key uh, areas, what we call the five characteristics of play that um, allow children, when these are present, they allow a deeper learning experience and allow children to start to foster holistic skills. So the first of these characteristics is that uh, the activity should be joyful. So this is linked to motivation and interest, and that leads to enhanced memory, attention and creativity. The second is uh, meaningful. So this really separates an activity from, you know, rote learning to something that is really engaging for the learner. And they're able to maybe connect things that they already know to some new piece of facts. The third characteristic is actively engaging. So this is something that, yeah, you're not distracted in other things. Your attention is there. You're able to control your behavior. You're really lost in this learning opportunity. The fourth characteristic is uh, iterative. So we all know <laughs> that there's rarely one path to get to an answer. And more and more in these technological changing times, we need to uh, have these flexible thinking, you know, perseverance, try different things. So that ability to be iterative is uh, really important. And then the fifth characteristic is uh, around uh, socially interactive. So, um, working with others uh, can help to reinforce learning and uh, is also critical for social skills as well. So at the uh, LEGO Foundation, uh, we are extremely interested in um, and focused on developing holistic skills, 21st century skills. And um, we know that learning is super complex and uh, we know that these characteristics these holistic skills, you can't really pull them apart. They're really integrated with each other. Uh, but we believe that this is, these uh, holistic skills are very important and need to be prioritized both now and as we think about the future. 
They're also something that should be prioritized um, globally and all children can benefit from developing these holistic skills. So the first is cognitive skills. So we, we've, uh, Jordi was talking about, you know, things like problem solving, flexible thinking, being able to tackle complex um, tasks. The second is being creative skills, building creative skills. So those that um, allow children to develop, express and evaluate ideas and solutions in meaningful ways. Then you have physical skills, so being able to uh, nurture dexterity and have a healthy body. The fourth is uh, social skills, so yeah, supporting children to be uh, great communicators, seeing things from others' perspectives. And then the final one, and very important, of course, is emotional. So being able to tackle your own emotions and being able to relate to others and build confidence. And we've seen, you know, in the last two years and with the pandemic that it's these recent global events really underlined the need for a generation of uh, creative lifelong learners, those that are able to uh, respond to change, generate solutions as well to these global challenges. So when we think about uh, specifically, how do we integrate technology in the classroom? We think that we can uh, build on uh, the understanding of what makes a great deep learning experience through these characteristics of play and think about how technology can also foster these holistic skills. So at the Lego Foundation, we're really focused on supporting children to have great experiences through learning through play with technology and being able to harness the potential of digital uh, technology to engage and motivate students. So as I said, we think that technology is a great way to build uh, holistic skills. And I'll come on to a moment with some examples. Uh, integrating technology in the classroom uh, obviously supports technical, technological literacy. So uh, supporting children to yeah, learn to code, learn to tinker, learn to you know, understand the basics of technology. And also, finally, technology can be uh, a great way to also teach uh, traditional content and uh, subject knowledge as well. So we've seen, you know, geology being able to uh, be taught through different technologies and being able to really uh, create a new solar system, uh, for example, through technology. So when we think of uh, learning through play with technology, these are really things that we think are hands-on, minds-on learning. So children having agency, children as active creators. And um, there are a couple of examples that I wanted to share with you to, so you could get a little bit more of a flavor of ways that we think children can really develop these breadth of skills and become technological savvy as well. So uh, one thing that we're interested in is making and tinkering. What I love about making and tinkering is it doesn't need high tech technology. It can be just whatever is lying around. It can be scrap. And so it really, in terms of the digital divide, making and tinkering is a really, really super way to build holistic skills, build basic computational and technology thinking. Uh, and it's really fun as well. So um, children, you know, it's easy for them to build, iterate, learn from failures and explore and invent uh, new things through uh, tinkering with different materials. Um, the second thing that we love to use is uh, robotics. So um, robotics is a great thing that can really um, be used to connect the digital and analog world. And so we see kids getting really uh, excited about working with robotics. And this can be, again, really low cost as well as more you know, uh, advanced robotics. Children can design, they can construct, they can pro program, operate these robots. Uh, we very often see kids being uh, um, being given these uh, problems which are uh, relevant to their context. So maybe it's something around water pollution or it could be something around climate change and children are um, introduced to the principles of robotics uh, through this technology and able to come up with uh, local solutions uh, to these problems and challenges. And often we see groups of children coming together and having a really fun experience around that. 
And then finally, we uh, I think another great example of learning through play with technology is creative coding. So platforms such as Scratch, which we'll share in a minute, these are ways that kids can um, own stories, create games, animation. And what's really nice about it is that children are able to gain support through an online community. So I'd like to just to take a couple of minutes and share a video from scratch. This is a video which is um, has examples of children from all across the world working with Scratch uh, in their local languages. And so Alicia, could you share the video, please? Around the world are creating their own stories, games, and animations with Scratch, a free programming language available in more than 60 languages. Educators, families, and community members support children as they imagine, play, create, and learn with Scratch. Scratch is not like a computer language to me. It's more like my diary. I get to do my own story. It's more about your imagination because there's no limit to it, so you can do mostly whatever you want. Why scratch in house? Uh, because we can uh, at the same time play and learn. Carrots are full of vitamins. I love scratch because I uh, learn from scratch coding and I have a lot of uh, projects. Scratch uh, close my son to me. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> really? We have this partnership with the government of Sao Paulo and this includes localizing all the like tutorials and guides that the Scratch Foundation produces so that the millions of students in the network of Sao Paulo can have access to it. Então acho sensacional assim a gente quando oferece oportunidades para os alunos se desenvolverem todo o potencial criativo deles e também que eles possam é, se expressar. El Scratch Day para mí es un día de celebración de pensamiento computacional. Aquí lo celebramos en México. Scratch Day es una fiesta. Hay diferentes tipos de actividades. Nos reúne como profesores, como familia. Lo mismo encuentras en todo el mundo. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's been quite a lot of evidence and uh, research around Scratch, and uh, we've seen that children develop wide ranging skills so such as innovation, collaboration, self expression. So, yeah, many of the skills that uh, Yorde was talking about at the start, um, as well as actually one of the skills that teachers say they, they see students really developing through Scratch is creativity as well, as well as technology literacy. So just to finish up then, uh, I think the, the main thing that we see is that children, the time is now, we really need to be supporting children to be having these rich learning experiences. We need to be supporting children and helping them prepare as you know the, the future of work uh, is uh, obviously unknown. And also we need children to, yeah, be active citizens in this new world as well. Uh, for us, it's not uh, about a specific technology, but really it's about allowing children to uh, not be passive users of technology, but rather be their protagonists, be creative, be able to iterate, learn, have meaningful experiences, and also enjoy working with technology and find that this is something that is exciting and something that they're engaged in. So 
Thank you very much for listening to me today, and I look forward to discussing with my fellow panelists in a shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona. Very insightful presentation. I do have a lot of uh, questions I would like you to drive, but we have to wait, okay? Because now uh, it's time for Sonia Prior, who will present uh, her, her work, and uh, then we'll uh, start with the panel. Thank you, Sonia. The stage is yours. Thank you, Jordi and Fiona. Um, wonderful comments and presentations. I have lots of questions too, so I'm excited to, to be here. I am going to share my screen first um, so that we can get started. Uh -oh. We see, okay, now. Now you can see it. Yeah, you just have to put the full screen and then. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Sonia Pryor Jones. I currently serve as the Chief Implementation Officer for the FAB Foundation. And just to tell you a little bit about the FAB Foundation, we are an international nonprofit. Uh, we started 11 years ago now in support of the Fab Lab Network and in advancing the use of digital fabrication technologies worldwide. Um, our work started originally out of the Center for Bits and Atoms from MIT and working to package what we refer to as an educational program, which is a set of tools all for the purpose of change. And we say change in education, community development, as well as workforce and entrepreneurship. We um, are the steward for an international network of fab labs, which includes over 2,000 of these uh, specific maker spaces in over 120 countries around the world. And I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about both our philosophy at the FAB Foundation for how these tools of innovation can be used to extend learning, um, as well as uh, some of the things that I've learned along the way in my career working in both higher education, um, K-12 and community development work. And so the topic today was uh, the idea of 21st century skills for the future. And you'll see on my opening slide, uh, a few words in red. Um, I think we need to be accelerating 21st century for the uh, skills for the future right now. Um, we are in a, in a very important time. And I think COVID and a number of the other things that have been happening around the world right now just have further um, helped us to understand and see how we really have to do this work right now. And so um, for our discussion uh, points, the things that I really focused on was thinking about the adoption of technology for future living and learning uh, to both uh, address job shortage as well as the emergence of new types of jobs and thinking about the role that education can and should play in preparing uh, students for this said future. And so when we think about the majority of educational systems around the world, and I have a pretty uh, American perspective on this. Uh, this is where I live. I live uh, in a place called Cleveland, Ohio, which is the Midwest of the United States. Um, the majority of our education systems have really been developed um, back in the 19th century when we thought about farming um, and agriculture primarily uh, around the world and particularly was a significant part of the growth um, of the United States uh, as, a, as a world power. And so those kinds of structures aren't necessarily meeting the needs of today, right? Uh, we, I, I chuckle a little bit because we've been talking about 21st century learning and skills for some time now. Um, and we're now, uh, you know, uh, over 20 years in. And so what needs to happen differently when we think about learning uh, for the people who are currently in the workplace, as well as uh, young people who are currently in our classrooms looking to be prepared not only for work, but also life in the 21st century. And what's always very interesting to me is many of the things that we want our young people to have a deeper learning around, they are experiencing socially um, in, in many parts of their lives outside of school. So how do we begin to tap into that 
and take advantage of it in a way that is going to make learning more meaningful for them in the classroom, as well as rethink how we accept, um, as well as um, uh, take advantage of the learning that our young people are doing outside of the classroom. And so what I'd like to do uh, is show a little video and I seem to be stuck here. Give me one second. Um, and so this video that I'm gonna play right now talks a little bit about Fab Labs and the kind of learning um, as well as social progress that we think can take place in these spaces. And then I'll uh, share a few more comments. If you could make almost anything, what would you do? With I would believe very strongly there's a kind of a dignity in making things. Fabrication is being digitized and becoming personal. This is the craft of our century. Fab Labs are about digital fabrication. It means you can design something and then a robotic machine will make it, bring it into life. It provides the means to create what you consume. It includes a 3D printer, a precision machine that can make electronic circuits. Fab Labs are in, we believe, about 75 to 80 countries, doubling in size every, say, 12 to 18 months. Probably the best single toy that mankind has ever invented. Where can they now make a societal impact, just like it is done in Kenya, Rwanda, India, China, the floating fab lab down the Amazon that they're trying? Putting a fab lab in a refugee camp provides creation and bootstrapping. It fits in a shipping container. It's a pretty cheap and efficient way to build relatively robust housing for refugee scenarios. It's not hard to find people who want to pay for one lab. What's harder is sort of creating the network that makes it all possible. It's been a problem trying to expand the network in Ghana. The more fab labs we have in a particular location, the better the chances of reaching people. Very often we say, oh, you know, the world is moving so fast and everybody, technology is so advanced. It's not advanced everywhere. It's not advanced with everyone. People who come in as novice are able to capture and make use of the tools and equipment within a short period of time. Fab labs are used exactly the same everywhere. They're used for play, for entertainment, for education, for creating businesses. When we introduced the lab, like people started trying new things, and now some users, they are making profit out of it. The person who worked in the lab showed me how my drawings can be translated, and we've made a couple of 3D prints. This way I can make uh, my work much, much larger. And that way I was able to create large-scale permanent public art. We used it as a space where you can bring divided communities together. We can connect people to work with Jewish and Arab together. And you see that when you make things, people don't think about religion. They only think about how to make it and collaborate. As much as anything, the social engineering is almost more important than the technical engineering. We expect uh, for this to be a vehicle to develop projects uh, that are actually addressing the two big issues that we are facing today. One is the social crisis we have in the inequality of distribution of resources, and also the dependence that we have as consumers of other supply chains. Give to the people the power to make things, not only to buy it. We like to create the conditions to empower the people and to empower the community. Aquaponics is self-sufficiency regarding to food to grow the same lettuce, let's say, in conventional agriculture and in aquaponics. You have a difference of 95%, which has a huge impact in the context of resource efficiency. It's going to get faster, better, cheaper. Using tools in Fab Labs to build more tools that can do other stranger things commoditizing of those resources that I, I think is a real game changer. We should take pride in the technology that we own, that we make, and we should take pride in our own ability to create those things. If we produce things more locally while we are connected globally, then we'll create a new society. It doesn't just simply address the root causes of inequality, it really fundamentally changes that discussion from money and jobs to creation. I've stopped sharing my screen because there's a little glitch on my end. I'll, I'll reshare. Um, but I think what I want to highlight are a couple of things that you heard um, from my If you could make almost... Uh, 
Um, here we are. I'm going to reshare my screen. I just want to underscore uh, some of the things that um, were shared in that video that I think really speak to us thinking about how we can accelerate the 21st century learning right now and why that's important. Um, the whole notion of uh, is being both a social and technical engineering uh, vehicle. Um, the whole notion that everyone everywhere does not have access to these technologies and how we need to change that. Um, and then the means to create what we consume. And it's not just consuming things that are tangible from the perspective of goods, but it's also consuming new learning. Um, and what role making and tools like digital fabrication in the hands of people everywhere, especially our youngest people who are preparing to lead us in the next century, um, how important it is for them to consume also the experience. Um, because those are the kinds of skills that really breed um, the ability to problem solve and the ability to innovate. And so as I think about 21st century learning, and what we need to accelerate and why it needs to happen right now. I think about it from the perspective of solving the common issues that we have in the world globally. Um, we know we have a number of political issues. Uh, there are a number of social class clashes, environmental crises, as well as high health crises. And all these things, particularly during this moment of COVID-19, have arrived at all of our doorsteps. And so what is it that we might think um, differently when it comes to learning, when it comes to everyone having the opportunity to build the 21st century skills that are needed for our entire world to advance? Um, we think about the UN sustainable uh, goals, which speaks to things like poverty, which speaks to things like environmental issues in the world, as well as the ro uh, role of girls and women um, in our future world. And what comes up for me are what I refer to as the five W's and the H. And so you guys remember this when we think about writing a paper or telling a story. It's who, what, when, where, why, and how. And some of the ways that I think about us accelerating learning and taking advantage of vehicles like Fab Labs and other maker spaces is with access to these technologies, with access to the communities that support these kinds of technologies and learning, we can accelerate the learning. We can focus on the global majority in our world. Right now, there are over 7 billion people on the planet. Um, our largest populations are in China and India. And then we've got about 1.3 billion people on the continent of Africa. So how can we start to focus on the, uh, the global majority in terms of thinking about their interests, their needs, and how that can accelerate learning based on meeting those. And then I think it needs to be happening everywhere. While I agree with Fiona's remarks about play um, and those characteristics, I think they all show up in these kinds of spaces and the ability for people to make and tinker can, can start with just about anything. I do also believe that everyone should have access to the advanced technologies that are available in the world and not just those who have the financial resource to do so. But if we think about this from a infrastructure perspective and ensure that these technologies and the human capital associated with them are accessible to everyone worldwide, we can begin together to solve some of our biggest problems. Um, I also say right now, again, so much of uh, the experience that kids have around the world are tied to old models for the last century. Um, right now, the technologies are available. So how do we get the courage and really push the issue to ensure that all students have access. And then I think our mental models have to change. No longer are we interested in learning just for the sake of kids um, going off to work a job right after high school, right after college. But we know that the learning that takes place in this century 
also has to be able to address the worldwide global problems and challenges that we face. Things like needing to create new vaccines and new distribution and logistics systems that save lives, uh, which is something we're experiencing right now in the midst of COVID-19. And one model that we might think about is, you know, the model of the sprint, you know, so taking something right out of the out of the playbook of technology and tech solutions is the whole notion of sprint productivity. And so with that, you really begin to focus on the core things that you need to accomplish in order to reach your objectives. You slim down your focus um, and you spend that time quickly deploying uh, the, the things that are needed in order to solve the problem. And I think in our quick deploy, advanced uh, providing access to these advanced technologies for school-aged children around the world where they can learn wherever they are in a classroom or at home um, on the other end of a computer or in a local community center or a local neighborhood um, is all important and should all be considered as we try to advance learning for the next century. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I really am excited to talk more with all of you about these ideas. Thank you. I was speaking, sorry, I was speaking, <laughs> but I was muted. I was saying thank you very much, Sonia, for this insightful presentation. Uh, we already have questions for you from the audience, but first of all, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, my own questions, okay? Um, by the way, uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that I see common things, right, uh, regarding your your uh, uh, own work. First of all, you are inspiring these new new generations of of kids uh, and also of adults, right, in in the, in the skills that are needed for this digital world. And also, um, I, I I see that actually you are both. Um, approaching this, this uh, let's say, skills teaching or lecturing through uh, uh, learning by doing approach, right? So uh, you are enabling the, the learners to apply into a meaningful, let's say, solutions, this um, technology or creativity, right? So I see like examples of housing, of uh, prothesis, uh, of uh, connected things and so on and so on. So it's a meaning, meaningful way of learning, which is very interesting. But I want to start with uh, a couple of provocative questions, okay? For both of you. Uh, the first is about the future of jobs, okay? Because um, we are speaking about um, how from schools we can teach um, our kids to learn those skills that will be needed in the, uh, maybe not the near future, but maybe in, in 20 years from now, right? Um, and you know that there are like uh, two ways of uh, thinking regarding the future of jobs. So there are those, those people who think that actually um, uh, digitization will drive to a, a heavily automation of jobs. And actually the result will be that we have uh, many people unemployed that maybe we'll have to request some sort of um, um, payments from the uh, from the government because otherwise people won't have jobs and so on and so on, right? Uh, we see people like uh, um, like Bill Gates asking for uh, tax robots and, and way of thinking. So they believe that the digitization will be so heavy that actually will create a disruption in the market and there will be a lot of people who will be idle because the technology and artificial intelligence will be working from them. And then there's also another trend that is the techno-optimistic uh, approach in which they believe that, okay, we've uh, seen this kind of revolutions in the past. We had the first industrial revolution, the second and the third. And of course they destroyed jobs, but they created way more jobs actually, right? And of course there is a phase of transition, but at the end we uh, will create a lot of jobs. For instance, this is the case of the, of the app economy, right? So before, Apple launched uh, iPhone, uh, we didn't have app developers because the app economy actually doesn't exist. The thing is that it is difficult to envision which will be the exact new jobs. We can envision what kind of skills we'll need, but we don't know about the exactly exact new jobs. But their optimism, they believe that humans are always so creative and they will create way more jobs than the ones that we will destroy. So my question is for both of you, whether if you are rather optimist or pessimist about the future of jobs. Thank you. 
Should I go first? So I'm definitely on the optimist angle. So I hope, wish, pray that uh, the trends that we're seeing right now of automation, you know, taking people's jobs, and particularly, you know, the inequality that we see in many countries and in different socioeconomic classes, I am hopeful, still optimistic, that we will turn a corner and that there will be a transformation of jobs and that we, we cannot be complacent by any means. But I, I am hopeful that uh, as a, as a you know, global, um, all global citizens can work together to uh, yeah, develop new jobs that we can't even dream of right now. That's the thing, that's the exciting thing. These jobs are just, unfathomable for us right now. These are jobs that we can't imagine. Um, and, I, and with me seeing, seeing that, I do then think that there's an even bigger pressure then to make sure that kids are equipped, that they can embrace and uh, can be, um, yeah, ready for these jobs that we can't even imagine in the future. Good. So we have a, a, an optimist here, optimistic. Thank you, Fiona. What about a you, cautious, Sonia? A cautious optimistic, I would say. <laughs> cautious. Yeah, yeah, of course. Always prevention. Uh, what about Sonia? I actually believe that they both will be true. Um, and I think you you said it best, uh, Jordi, when you mentioned there would be a transition, right? And so I, I think we will have a moment in which um, there may be an increase in the number of automated jobs and we see you know, a de decrease of humans in those roles. But I also think if we do our jobs right in the here and now, it'll be a quick transition um, and it won't be super painful. Um, it doesn't have to be. And I say in all of this, we also, just like we can't imagine the jobs of the future, I think we have to begin to reimagine what work looks like in the future. And so work doesn't have to be 40 hours a week with two, vaca two weeks of vacation anymore, right? Um, a number of us are in, in the midst of that right now, those of us who are, who are uh, blessed enough to be able to work from home and to work remotely and have all the technology that we need to do our job. We work in a knowledge economy. I think our job is to get more people in that part of the economy. And there have been so many people, that global majority that I mentioned, that have been left out of the knowledge economy. I think, how do we use technology to shift more people into that part of the world of work? And how do we do it in a way um, that is you know, respectful of, of the different diversity and the cultures and the beliefs and the interests of all of our global citizens? I think that is you know, the trickiest part of all of this. Okay, interesting ideas. I think we are all pretty agree with nuances, but we are all pretty agree. Now another provocative question for both of you. Um, I don't know if, um, of, of course, I, I'm sure that you're aware about this bestseller author is uh, Noah Harari, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Um, about, he's written about uh, sapiens and the history of humanity, but also about the future of humanity. So he's also a futurist. And he was writing uh, an article recently, or maybe a couple of years ago, about um, the future of jobs also. And he actually envisioned a future, not even 20 years from now, maybe 30 years from now or 40, in which actually technology uh, will self-program itself. So we won't need uh, software developers because um, software will program itself. See, we are, we are going far in the future, okay? Um, and actually, you're both, especially in the case of Fiona, where you're lecturing Scratch in your in Lego program, right? You're uh, teaching uh, kids to 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 actually uh, learn a simple uh, programming language, okay? But it's very useful for them because this is a good way to start. So, what do you think about that? Do you think is the this is the, the future of programming, or maybe even if it's that's true, uh, we still need to teach. Um, uh, kids how programming works in order to understand the language of the future, even though uh, we won't need programmers because machines will self-program themselves. What do you think? Yeah, for me, it's definitely the second. I, I could quite imagine, I haven't heard that statistic, but um, it is quite frightening to think in 20 or 30 years, uh, the uh, technology is just self-programming and <laughs> going into 
creating whatever uh, they still want. Um, but I do still believe that it is it's useful to I think have a to have a good understanding of the kind of fundamentals of how technology works and understand the kind of the logic, the computational thinking that comes uh, that underlies you know most uh, programming languages. So I think you may be right. There might become a time where, uh, at least for the majority of people, they might not have to. Uh, it might not be a, a uh, a good job to go into to be a computer programmer but I still think that uh, having yeah the logic and as you said in your opening speech being able to uh, yeah have the soft skills around the technology that exists and so and being that interface with technology that's going to be important as well and I, and I don't believe that's going to happen in 20 or 30 years where uh, the robots will be <laughs> as personable as you are. <laughs> Good, good. So it's not only about um, ha having this hard skill in order to develop technology, but at least to know what technology is, is, is able to do, right? And, and what is the potential yeah. of technology, the use case, right? So, Sonia, yeah. what, what, what about you? Yes, I, I think that's a little uh, dim. <laughs> so, so I hope not. Um, I think for me, the thing that, that comes up is we will always, in my mind, need people, right? And you mentioned in your slides earlier on, Jordi, um, there are the technological skills that are necessary, but there, there are also what I refer to as the core skills or the interpersonal skills, right? Around communication, around relationship building. All of those things are also essential and have been throughout um, humankind. And so I think that will continue to be the case. And I think about the world of work and society will still need contributions that are centered in our humanness, right? Um, and I think things like music, literature, um, other forms of the arts or soul creation, if you will, also help to shape things that are important in how we use technology like ethics, like equality. And so I think there's not a, a one version of a life in the future with technology, but if we're going to really um, take technology to its maximum use um, and, and it's going to do the best for all of us, those things are going to be necessary as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, now we have a couple of questions from the audience. So um, let me share those questions to you. The first would be rather for uh, uh, Sonia, okay? She's uh, Neus Munoz. She is, in, uh, uh, well, I guess that she's uh, uh, managing or maybe is a lecturer in one school, okay? And she has a question. She says, how a person that is actually restless and is curious, um, but with uh, few knowledge about uh, hard skills and technical technological skills can get in touch with a, a fab lab and what could this person do actually even though it doesn't hold uh, technical skills so how can a person with limited tech, limited or no technical skills take advantage but of but interested but very interested in getting in this uh, field i think they just go in and they play um one of the most beautiful things that i loved about fiona's presentation were the five characteristics of play because I think all of those things have an opportunity to play out in a fab lab or maker space. I think um, one of the things in our, in our network, there's a community of open-mindedness and a community sharing. And so what we like to do in our fab labs is there's usually someone there to support you in your learning. You can show up during open access hours to any fab lab around the world. And there's going to be someone there with technical knowledge who can support you. And so you can come into the doors with no skills, with just an idea, and they can work with you on learning something that is driven by your interest. So for example, you know, I want to make a t-shirt because I have a family reunion. This is summer and I'm in the United States. Family reunions are very popular. I have a family reunion I'm going to next week, and I, I want to make a t-shirt with that. I could come into that space and I can say, that's what I want to do with my time. And I will walk out of there because I'm motivated by my interests and what I want to accomplish, having learned new skills, right? And those skills can be built upon just like any other learning. 
And by the way, um, don't you have uh, the, the, the feeling that actually this high end technology like sensors, big data, IoT is uh, somehow being uh, way more abstract and, and, and also more like uh, commoditized in the sense, for instance, I was in the video of Fiona, I see like uh, some sort of um, bits that you can just plug in, right? And there is one sensor, then there is a, a I don't know, an output about light or about whatever, right? And it's something that actually almost anyone could uh, actually easily understand, right? And, and, and put into place. Yes, yes, there are so many um, new, uh, very accept high, highly accessible, low-end um, versions of these technologies that are on the market um, that people can buy, you know, in some cases from your local toy store um, or your local big box store or, um, you know, from educational uh, service uh, kinds of organizations as well. And so there are far more entry points is what I like to call them for people at different skill sets. And I always like to think about this work on a continuum, right? There are, you know, the pieces of paper that are right here on my desk that I can spend time folding and learn about, you know, some basic math skills. There are, you know, pencils and crayons and all those things that are accessible. We spent a lot of time during COVID um, working with people with just household items, you know? So your toilet paper roll or, you know, a leftover popsicle stick, a piece of aluminum foil and how you pull all those things together to make something. And now that you've prototyped, if you're gonna have the opportunity now to go into a fab lab where they have laser cutters and 3D printing and digital design software, how can you take that prototype you made at home with household items and turn it into something different based on the digital tools that are also available to you? And so I think it's important to help people see that the technology is really about advancing an idea um, or the learning because it's an additional platform for you to do so. Okay. Um, now I, I will drive to you also, uh, to both of you, uh, starting by Fiona, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, he's David Mata from uh, Open University of Catalonia, is an online university. And uh, he says that uh, he would like to know if the panelists are agree with uh, the following statement, his own statement, okay? Um, and it says like that, like I'm translating, okay? That's why I take my time because I'm translating. Um, what is really important to their priority is to uh, teach people. So to train them, of course, on top of a, a technological uh, layer or support, but what is really important is to teach people and that will be the uh, cognitive um, skills and social skills uh, which will be actually f important in the future rather more important in the future so it's more about teaching people that, than, than teaching technology yeah I would, def I would definitely agree with that yeah yeah and I loved actually what Sonia just said there uh, she actually wrote the bound. So, you know, the technology is advancing idea or the learning. And so, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what the technology is. And, you know, Sonia just said there, it could be a piece of paper or then, you know, you could go in a fab lab and then, you know, tinker around with laser cutters or something else. But what is more important to, um, yeah, the, the gentleman's uh, comment is providing learning experiences that children can foster yeah, the cognitive skills or you know collaboration or negotiation problem solving and then the layer on top is definitely yeah it can be technology and it can um yeah to sonia's point advance the idea or the learning okay um let, let's move to 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 um or keep uh, speaking about uh, skills okay the the, the required skills um, actually um this is my own feeling okay so not always the best students in, at school are the most successful let's say uh, people in in maybe in life or maybe in in the pro, in their professional life of course each one can have their own uh, definition about success okay but you follow uh, me right so not always the best student the one has higher marks is always always the best and the most successful uh, professional 
person, right? So uh, probably it's because the, the skills needed in the marketplace or, or jobs and so on are not exactly the ones that are being evaluated uh, at school. I'm not saying that they're not learned, but maybe they're not exact, exactly the ones that they're evaluated. On the other hand, there are other skills, those so-called uh, soft skills that you were speaking about, like, I don't know, communication abilities, or even attitudes, like long life learning is, is rather an attitude, right? Um, that or holding passion for your work and so on, that actually um, are way more um, evaluated in the market rather than hard skills. So my question would be, first of all, if you agree with that or not, but, but secondly, to what extent those skills can actually be uh, teach it and lecture it at school. So to what extent you can, for instance, teach or provoke certain attitudes, if it is possible or not, and how? Because it is very easy to understand how to teach hard skills. It's not as easy to understand uh, how to teach, for instance, attitudes. Like uh, you have to become, you are saying, Fiona, uh, we encourage long life learning for our kids, how, how to do it, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, oh, sorry, Sonia, do you want to go first here? Oh, no, no, go I'll ahead. Let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, just even the example that, you know, Sonia was giving there in the, in the Fab Lab, you know, of how, how a student comes in and, you know, they're trying to figure out, they got this piece of paper and, and have maybe done some work in angles, and now they're approaching maybe a piece of technology and figuring out the laser cutter. They're, it's almost impossible to get that right first time. And maybe they're working with their peers and they're negotiating like, ah, oh, should we do it this way? Should we not do it that way? And they do something, it probably doesn't work. And so, you know, they try another approach. And really what we're seeing there in that experience is you are helping children to develop attitudes. So you're helping them develop, you know, perseverance. You're helping them to develop, you know, the attitude of like, don't give up. You know, we got to constantly try and iterate, try and figure out if this is working or not. Um, they're having to, you know, uh, yeah, collaborate with their peers. You know, often we have we think we've got the best idea and then someone else thinks they have the best idea. So, you know, they're really having to work with their fellow students to figure out, you know, how to uh, get to the get to the point that they want to. But all of this experience is, is really supporting students to, uh, yeah, develop this kind of range of skills, which we know in the workplace is so, so, so important. By the way, Fiona, were you a good student when you went to school? Uh, I wasn't you very good, good. I wasn't very good at memorizing knowledge. Like that was definitely my, uh, my weak point. Weak and, uh, yeah, and in, the, in our education system, it was very much assessment was built on, uh, yeah, memorization of facts. And I did pretty well in the project work and I really, really enjoyed it. And then it would get to the end of the year and I basically, you know, Monday morning between 11 and one, you had to show everything that you knew about bio biology with the questions that were asked. I was awful, I was petrified. But yeah, give me, give me a classroom and could tinker away with different concepts, I loved it. Good, so good. maybe wasn't the best student. Thankfully, but I, was I think I think methodologies, uh, of course, are changing, uh, and also yeah. thank, thanks to Absolutely. approaches like yours, right? That you're provoking change also at schools. We will speak about yeah. how to integrate your uh, kind of initiatives within the schools, because in the case of Fiona, it's collaborating with the schools, or you can be inside the school. While in the case of the Fab Labs, I know that you collaborate with the schools, but uh, the feeling is that it's uh, rather an open space of, of uh, learning in which everyone can, can join, not only schools, right? Um, but Sonia, what about um, uh, my question about, about those skills? To what extent you can teach those skills, those soft skills? Um, I would agree with uh, um, what Fiona was saying, and I would add that sometimes you can't teach the skills, but you can create the environment, right? And you can also give the opportunity for practice. And so I think so much of what we see, you know, the translation from school to work for people is the opportunity to practice and be in the kind of nurturing environments that allow for those attitudes and those skills to be created. I remember speaking to someone um, who I have a lot of respect for who does amazing work in Detroit. And he was saying to me, 
well, a lot of people keep recreating the educational system the way it is because it's the system that worked for them, right? And so if you are a kid who went to school and you got high marks and you made it through that system, you think that system is okay and fine, right? But if you're a kid who maybe has a learning disability or some issues with their, their family life that make the current system of school not work for them, then you're looking for some other avenues. And I think some of the people that we saw go out in the, the real world, the working world, and be very successful and had not been successful in school is because they were really forced to create a new system for themselves. And so how do we do a better job, you know, at, you know, the powers that be in creating the kind of infrastructure and system that really breeds the environment for creativity? And I think a lot of that has to do with more personalized learning, really better understanding who our young people are and lessening the load of the, hmm, what do I call it? The tight bureaucratic structures that are on schools because we know we've seen it work for you know a few that the whole idea of open project-based learning is really where kids get excited, they get passionate and the kind of deeper learning that we're after really does take place. Good. Well, uh, so far we've, we've been speaking rather about the, the skills, the skills that the kids of the future or, or the adults of the future, now are kids, they will have to hold. And I understand that they will have, according to your approach, a, a balance. They will need a balance between hard skills, rather digital skills, but also those soft skills that will make them, uh, you know, be more competitive um, uh, in the marketplace. So um, now I'd like to speak about uh, ways of learning or methodologies to teach those, those kids. So um, there's actually also um, a bit of your your topic of expertise. Um, for instance, um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure to be a member of the, of the jury of a, a program, it's called M Schools Awards, organized by, by M Schools. The program is actually holding, is hosting this um, um, uh, session of today. And actually I felt that, uh, well, this is about a, an award, maybe you're, you're aware about it. this is an award, uh, launched it um, where participate in many uh, students from uh, the uh, Catalonia, from Catalonia, they participate they're like uh, secondary school kids mostly, and they actually uh, learn how to develop mobile apps. But um, what they have to do is to develop like almost like a business startup. So they have to um, create a, a startup, a business model um, uh, that actually responds to a real challenge. As you were mentioning, a real challenge that can have uh, can ha have a certain relation with, for instance, climate change or sharing economy or whatever, something that actually they understand that is a need in, in the society. And so it's, it goes far beyond developing uh, a mobile app. It goes uh, about, uh, is about creating a meaningful tool. And uh, I, I could appreciate that those kids were so motivated when they were um, presenting their, their work right in front of the jury, they were so motivated and excited, right? Because they learned a lot of things and they you know, could imagine themselves launching this uh, business model in the future, like if they were um, uh, entrepreneurs. So I, I had the feeling that when you give a, a meaningful uh, learning or, or they, when they understand why they're doing something, uh, actually is way more appealing for them and way more engaging. So also learning is way more productive also, right? Um, if you just uh, teach them how to program, probably the level of, uh, you know, uh, appealingness and excitement will, wouldn't be the same. So, um, of course, this is something that uh, teachers already know. And um, there's a lot of literature about how to learn through uh, projects instead of, you know, separate uh, subjects and so on and so on. So, of course, they already aware that they have to go through through this, but uh, sometimes it is difficult to apply it in the school. So, what would you recommend to a school that wants to, you know, promote uh, this meaningful um, learning to their uh, kids and students in order to to make their, uh, let's say, lecturings uh, more engaging? What would be your Two recommendations that we'll make for them. I guess my recommendations are, are probably a little out there. And I, and I say this as a parent 
who have gotten two children through a school, through secondary school, and you know now in college, I a part of me just says blow it all up, right? <laughs> um, and that is because I think um, within the constraints um, of the of the school systems and the education system as the, as it exists. I, you know, think we have to do something different, right? We can't just blow it all up. And so when you can't blow it all up, what can you do? I think you can first spend um, most of your time getting to know the students, the learners, the humans that show up in your classroom every day. Who are they? What are they interested in? What are their needs, right? And I think spending time creating content and learning experiences that first focus on their interests and needs at a personal level and from the interests and needs of society as a whole, things like climate change. And then I think it's up to us, the adults, to come up with creative content that makes sure they hit all the standards, but more importantly, they hit interests and needs first. And so that's my general um, philosophy <laughs> that I think would create a, a far more enriching learning experience for young people in the classroom. Thank you, what about Fiona? Maybe just following on a little bit uh, what Sonia said there. I think um, I think there there are a lot of resources out there, which is you know fabulous. And as she said, this is not nothing new to so many uh, teachers. So I think uh, probably uh, lean on the resources that are available. I would also say. Uh, you know, from my experience of being a teacher, it's a little bit as well around, you know, your own mindset. So, you know, instead of thinking about you at the front of the class, you know, uh, being the geography expert and, and being able to provide all the knowledge to the children, it's actually being a little bit vulnerable and thinking about, you know, supporting children through this interactive learning experience, but also knowing that you're, you don't know all the answers because, you don't know what's going to be the outcome. The kids are going to come up with stuff that are really is going to be unpredictable. And so being uh, open to that as well and enjoying that, you know, you are also uh, a learner in this experience as well. Um, and, and maybe having peers that you can, you know, exchange knowledge with and, and get that support uh, network around you as well. I mean, ideally, you would have a school leadership that fully embrace uh, a changing way of teaching. Uh, sometimes that's not there. And so making sure that you have, uh, yeah, peers around you, whether it is your school leader or, you know, other teachers that you can kind of bounce around ideas and so on. But I love that idea of Sonia's around, you know, starting with the children first and thinking about what are going to be great, meaningful experiences for them. Fiona, you, you just uh, raised an interesting topic. It is true that in the past, actually, knowledge was uh, basically in the books and the school was in the books and maybe in the mind of the of the teacher so they had the control of, of knowledge and nowadays thanks to digitization and the cloud actually knowledge is is everywhere we can just uh, you know uh, ask it yeah. online and um, so of course we have to rethink uh, the role of the of the teacher we will uh, keep uh, needing teachers. So of course, in this case, uh, we don't think that actually digitization will replace teacher, but it will enhance its, uh, let's say, performance. And also we will, uh, we think that we, the, the role has to be reshaped, right? So they have uh, to play another role rather like a coach than, than a, uh, just a lecturer. So how do you imagine the, the teacher of the, uh, from te in 10 years from now, what, what do you believe that will be the, the role of the teacher, for instance? I think- even I know there are difficult questions, <laughs> but that's why we have uh, such an- I mean, I, I think funny. you're right. Yeah, I was just gonna say- I think, <laughs> I, I think you're, uh, go Sonia. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think even right now, the role of teacher um, to be more impactful is that of a learning facilitator, right? And to Fiona's point, they're facilitating their own learning um, as well as supporting the learning in their classroom and in that environment. I also would love to see teachers as curators, right? Um, and I say that because to your point, Jordy, learning and information and knowledge is everywhere. And so how can our, our teachers who are learning facilitators and curators of knowledge also helping connect people to information and resources that they may not be aware of. I also am hoping that there's a future in which learning is not only happening in classrooms or in schools, 
but learning is also taking place in your local art museum or your local zoo or in some kind of a, you know, project that you have with, you know, one kid who's living in Dubai and another one who's living in Wisconsin, right? Um, and so how can teachers help to create and support those kinds of learning exchanges and opportunities? Um, I think that is the wave of a future kind of uh, education system that I would be really excited and being a part of. And I think back to my days, I taught kindergarten for a little while. So I've taught, you know, kindergarten and adults. And I think about the learning centers, right? You know, and the idea of choice. And in most kindergarten classrooms anywhere around the world, kids, you know, you've curated for them a couple of core things that you need know they need to know to move on to the next place. But there's a lot of choice, right? And there's a lot of time spent on community building and social skills. And so how do we articulate kindergarten up, if you will, um, to the, the older grades and really figure out how to facilitate learning and how to curate learning for our, for our young people? Just five minutes left. So I would like, yeah, I would like to start just a last question. Um, well, now what? changing so fast there are also certain disruptive approaches of uh, learning institutions of teaching institutions that are bringing in the market to give you an example um, it was in 2020 September 2020 the vice president of uh, Google said that from now on they will consider equally uh, candidates that come for instance from the university graduates that people who just um, learn their uh, online course that is uploaded in, in Coursera this MOOCs uh, platform that it takes uh, on average six months and it costs like uh, $300 more or less on average right so this is a disruptive approach right but also a pretty market uh, let's say driven uh, approach in the sense that probably this um, uh, course of Google uh, is about the skills that the uh, employees of Google need. Um, we also are seeing this phenomenon of uh, boot camps, so with very intensive courses in especially programming, but also in user experience, also in big data, in which in only three months you you provide an intensive um, uh, learning in, for instance, certain programming languages and frameworks that are the most requested in the market. So you can create employability in in, in a short term, right, in a short period of time. Um, actually, your examples are examples of uh, uh, learning um, value propositions that are really aligned with the market needs. But there's also this, uh, let's say, claim, uh, especially from companies that say, okay, but universities and schools, uh, they, they teach skills that are far from what we need, and, and they are not sometimes agile enough in order to adapt to what we need, okay? I'm not saying that they, they, they're right, that this is a traditional claim, right? And uh, on the other hand, it's true that uh, according to their nature, schools cannot be as adaptive as those uh, new approaches like MOOCs or, or, or boot camps or, or your approach, right? So uh, how can institutions like universities or, or schools be more adaptive and more um, and change more rapidly because the, the, the environment is changing so fast, okay? So um, how can they be more adaptive and agile in order to, to, to provide those skills that will be evolving um, over the common years? coming years. This is last question, so come on, who, who starts? I'll go first then. So just a couple of thoughts on that. I think, uh, well, we have seen quite some cool examples of um, in education systems, uh, people from organizations like Google, like Uber coming into the schools and like, creating these little boot camps and running these kind of hands-on learning experiences. So I think that's a great way. I don't think kids can like just automatically go into one of these boot camps and learn skills in three months. They need these foundational skills. So to be able to have that adaptive learning mindset to do that. But I think that's a great example where industries can connect with education systems and provide kind of real practical examples of uh, different types of skills. Then I, uh, yeah. I think that's a cool way for students to learn as well. What about Sonia? I agree with Fiona and, you know, I, I also have the pleasure of serving on a, um, a college board of trustees. And so this is something that we're all struggling with, right? Because 
all of these systems changing that we're that we're pushing after also have bottom line economics associated with them, right? We have created full industries, right? Um, for, you know, hundreds of years at this point that um, support how education currently happens. And so I think we have to figure out new business models that will also support the kind of innovation that we're after while also creating more equity and not necessarily throwing away everything that currently exists. I'm a graduate of a liberal arts institution. I study international studies and history as an undergraduate major, right? But I work in STEM. And so there's something about learning how to learn and learning how to learn in different contexts that was really valuable from my learning experience in college. And so how do we also ensure that for people? Um, and I don't know the answer, but I do know that we have to think about the business model and the economics of it as well, if we want it to happen quickly. Sonia and Fiona, thank you very much. Today, my objective for today was to, to, to enjoy and to learn from you. And I think both objectives were uh, achieved. So thank you very much uh, for your insightful presentations, for sharing your, your knowledge and ideas. And I hope that we will meet sometime in the future because you know the ecosystem of knowledge is not that big. So I'm sure that we will, uh, we will uh, maybe catch up sometime. So thank you very much. We have to finish now. Thank Sharp, you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.